In the remote wilderness of central China, an American scientist tracks an elusive animal in its last refuge, the icy mountain ramparts near the border of Tibet. Sequestered in this inaccessible universe, the giant panda was revealed to the Western world only a hundred years ago. Today, it remains mysterious and enigmatic. So little is known about the giant panda that baffling questions about it are yet to be resolved. How much does it eat? How far does it travel? How much space does it require? But the most nagging question of all, can it survive? For the giant panda is one of the most endangered species on Earth. The Chinese have allowed only 40 pandas to leave their homeland. Wherever they go, they create intense excitement. Today, scientists are intensifying their efforts to understand this rare and troubled species. Now she starts to break it up here in a minute. Okay, now what is she doing? She's shredding it. Yeah. Huh? yeah. She tries to break Researchers it up. are at work really like from Washington's like National it. Zoo to the ever shrinking bamboo forests of China, where the shy mammal clings to existence. Confronting challenges and hardship, conservationists, scientists, and governments have dedicated themselves in an extraordinary effort to save the panda. <laughs> so remote that fact and legend mingle, there are references to a mysterious animal the Chinese called Bishong, the white bear. The ancient chronicles of China record that a giant panda was included in a tribute from the kingdom of Qin to the kingdom of Yu. Japanese imperial annals recount that in 685 AD, China's emperor sent the ruler of Japan a gift of two live white bears and 70 white bear skins. But secluded in remote mountains, shrouded by mist, clouds, and snow, the land of the giant panda was seldom penetrated. Even the local people could have lived and died without ever setting eyes on the elusive animal. The deep forests and dense bamboo thickets held the secret of the giant panda for thousands of years. It was not until 1869 that the Western world was made aware of its existence when the French missionary priest and naturalist, Père Armand David, discovered the strange bamboo-eating creature. But the giant panda remained one of the rarest animals known to man. Then, in 1929, Theodore Roosevelt, Jr. and his brother Kermit led a successful expedition to acquire a giant panda skin for Chicago's Field Museum of Natural History. Soon, a succession of intrepid hunters, brave marauding bandits and primitive conditions as American natural history institutions contended for giant panda skins. In 1936, Mrs. Ruth Harkness journeyed to China to realize the dream her husband had died trying to fulfill and returned with the first live panda the West had ever seen, 
Su Lin. In 1937, Ruth Harkness brought back a second live panda to join Su Lin. By now, the most famous animal of the 20th century. Dean Sage acquired this lively baby for the New York Zoological Society. What makes a giant panda so valuable? The giant panda is valuable because it is exceedingly rare and because it is very hard to capture one. How did he react to the aeroplane crash? The panda reacted very well in the air. She was not bothered by the trip and slept most of the time. Soon, England joined the exclusive panda club, and the craze called pandemonium swept through London. At Regent's Park Zoo, the princesses Elizabeth and Margaret met Ming. And when England went to war, the panda's hijinks brought joy to a public that desperately needed it. In 1963, history was made at the Peking Zoo when the first giant panda was born in captivity. By this time, all but two giant pandas in zoos outside China had died. In 1966, the Iron Curtain was temporarily lifted. In an attempt to mate the two survivors, Chichi, a female from the London Zoo, was flown to the Soviet Union. Her arrival was greeted with much fanfare and attention from the international press, as An An waited at the Moscow Zoo. Repeated efforts to mate the pair ended in failure. The years of unsuccessful attempts at breeding pandas in zoos outside China had begun. But for now, no more pandas were to leave the People's Republic for Europe or America. China isolated itself from the West. Radical policies were instituted as the peasants were collectivized, and extensive land reforms were set in motion. Recovering from internal and external warfare, caught in the throes of massive social change, the Chinese struggled to feed 700 million people. Hundreds of thousands of laborers toiled to modernize China, to industrialize what was still basically an ancient feudal society, and to transform it into a 20th-century giant. A surge of radical fervor, which Chairman Mao called the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution, launched massive political upheaval. The nation was rocked by turmoil and fear. After Mao's death in 1976, the revolutionary energies that had been unleashed wound down. The country seemed to stabilize, to pause, and take a breath. The Chinese could now turn their attention to wildlife conservation. Filled with a new sense of pride, realizing that the panda was a national treasure, the government gave the animal official protection.
But each year, the burgeoning population encroached further on the panda's last refuge. Even within the reserves, people who had traditionally lived there were allowed to follow their old ways of life. More and more wild lands gave way to the plow. Each season saw livestock grazing higher on the mountainsides, denuding them of fragile vegetation. The forests themselves were being destroyed to provide needed housing. Then, in the mid-1970s, a natural phenomenon occurred as it does every 70 to 80 years. In the Min Mountains, the umbrella bamboo flowered and died. In ancient times, the pandas could have traveled to other areas where the bamboo would not be in its cyclical die-off. But now, nearly 150 pandas died of starvation. About 10% of the entire population wiped out within months. Gravely alarmed, the Chinese government asked the World Wildlife Fund International to join in an accelerated conservation program. Dr. Deborah Kleiman of the United States National Zoo and Dr. Emil Delensek of the New York Zoological Society were selected to join Dr. George Schaller, co-field director of the Panda Project. did that article. That's good for the panda. Schaller's wife, Kay, will assist him. <laughs> Never before had the Chinese government asked a private organization to help with wildlife conservation. Following the route taken by many early panda hunters and collectors, the scientists leave the walled city of Chengdu, once a link to the caravan trade on the fabled Silk Road. They are among the first Westerners to enter this area since the 1930s and the first ever to be invited here. Four hours over rough roads from Chengdu they reach a wilderness of jagged, tree-spiked peaks, reminiscent of classical Chinese paintings. This is the home of the giant panda. Although grappling with the problems of feeding an enormous population, the Chinese government has nevertheless set aside 10 tracts of land to protect the remaining pandas. In prehistoric times, Pandas roamed over much of eastern China and Burma. Today, due to the destruction of natural habitat, their range has shrunk to these tiny areas. Wo Long, where the World Wildlife Fund team will work, is the largest of the reserves. At administrative headquarters, the staff welcomes the team. The departure point for Schaller's research camp is a 10-minute drive away. Even inside the reserve, there are scattered settlements. The Chiang are one of China's national minorities. Their Tibetan heritage is reflected in their features, traditional dress, and way of life. As Westerners, the Shallers are endlessly fascinating to the Chiang. Thank you. 
Here, on the Pitya River, the elevation is almost 6,000 feet. There is only one way to reach the research camp, so the shallows begin a 2,000-foot climb up the mountainside. Every bit of food, every piece of equipment to be used there must be carried on the backs of the scientists and Chiang porters. The trail will become increasingly steep and treacherous. The panda breeding station where Deborah Kleiman and Emil Delensek are headed is high in a neighboring valley. They too must make a rugged 2,000-foot climb. In the days when commercial logging was carried out here, workers died blasting these tunnels through the peaks. Named for them, the area is called Ingshango, Valley of the Heroes. Three veterinarians and several keepers take care of the seven pandas here. Rice gruel, fortified with vitamins and minerals, supplements the panda's staple diet of bamboo. Enriched bread is baked for them by the camp cook. With a digestive system ill-suited for extracting the food value in bamboo, each adult animal must consume up to 40 pounds daily. Wood is not a part of their diet, just a toy for this member of a species that likes to play. Dr. Kleiman has come here to facilitate natural breeding. With so few pandas left, it is now urgent that all of them reproduce. Uh, last year we tried Jin Jin and San San, didn't we? And we also have done the same this year. Uh, but it doesn't seem to work so well. But it may change when, when they're in heat. It if the natural there. mating attempts fail, Dr. Delensek will perform an artificial insemination. Behind the holding pens are large areas of enclosed natural habitat where the pandas can roam freely. For the researchers, this offers a unique opportunity for study. Even the giant panda's position in evolutionary history remains obscure. Some scientists say that it is most closely related to the red panda, which they place in the raccoon family. Some have found it strikingly similar to bears, while others place it in a group of its own. This century-old controversy continues to tantalize scientists. But for now, the questions are more immediate and pragmatic. When will the breeding age female reach her period of peak heat? And will the attempts at natural breeding succeed? Much of Dr. Kleiman's work consists of daily observation of the female panda, now in her reproductive cycle. Kleiman has found that among mammals,
Vocalization and behavioral changes in the panda are unusually pronounced. Sissa, good morning. How are you doing today? You've been bleating a lot in the past few days. You coming in to heat, Sessa? Are you bleating in response to Lily? <laughs> Ping Ping, I didn't let you out today yet. Oh, I know you really like to get at me. But you know, if we um, chatted for a while, perhaps we could be friends. Oh, you're looking okay, though. Panda's vocalizations help the solitary males and females find each other in the dense bamboo forest. As she nears her period of peak receptivity, the female's bleating increases. There are only one to three days in the entire year when the female can become pregnant. <coughs> Lily's scent markings, posturings, restlessness, and vocalizations all indicate that she has reached peak heat. The male, released to join her, seems unresponsive at first. <coughs> then attempts to mate. attempt has ended in failure. There are only a few hours left in which Lily is capable of becoming pregnant. hundred years after its discovery, no detailed field study of the giant panda was made until the Chinese initiated investigations in the 1970s. Then, in 1980, Project Panda began. George Shalley says, Anybody who has lived for a moderate number of years will have seen areas that have been destroyed natural areas that have been destroyed in a very short time. And my personal feeling is that one of the things one can do that is not only of benefit to this generation, but all future generations is fight for the protection of nature. One of the world's foremost field biologists, Schaller is the director of the New York Zoological Society's Animal Research and Conservation Center. He has made landmark studies of mountain gorillas in Africa tigers in India, jaguars in Brazil, and the elusive snow leopard in the Himalayas. I was basically attracted to studying animals because I like to observe animals. So it's very frustrating to study pandas because you're almost well, studying an abstraction. Your notebooks are full of little symbols of which direction the animal is, is it active or inactive, but it still doesn't replace actually seeing the animal. To come too close to the pandas would disturb their natural behavior, so he purposely tracks them from a distance. Mm -hmm. 
Carved out of the Oolong wilderness, a rough camp serves as research headquarters. From it, a group of workers sets out to trap a panda. If successful, they will fit it with a radio collar and release it back into the wild. <laughs> Monitoring the radio signals will allow the researchers to follow the panda's movements year-round. For without snow on the ground, following panda tracks through steep forests of nearly impenetrable bamboo is virtually impossible. One of seven traps is set up near a stream where pandas are known to drink. Logs will camouflage each trap and anchor it firmly to the ground. A trigger mechanism is rigged to the trap door. At headquarters, researchers confer with Hu Jin Chu, a professor at Nanchang Teachers College, who has been working in Oolong since the early 70s. With George Scheller, he is now co-field director of the Panda Project. When all the traps are set up, a team goes out to bait them. For hundreds of thousands of years, pandas have been adapted to eating bamboo almost exclusively. But they are still carnivores, too slow to catch most prey. They are nevertheless extremely fond of meat. Bones and mutton are smoked in hope that the scent will lure a panda. meat is placed in the trap. The door is tested once more and the waiting begins. Of the five pandas already collared, only one is a male. If they capture another male, researchers can begin to study social interactions between the two. <laughs> Dr. Wang Xiang Ching, a veterinarian from the breeding station, is standing by to immobilize any captured animals. Late one afternoon, the call Shung Mao echoes through the camp as a runner brings the news that a large panda has been caught. It is in one of the distant traps at 11,000 feet, a rough two-hour hike away. They must hurry to get there before dark. Professor Hu and Dr. Wang are concerned about the well-being of the panda. Estimating its weight, they decide on the dosage of immobilizing drug to be administered.
It will be about ten minutes before the drug is effective. The radio collar is securely fitted to stay on the animal for two years. Because the drug inhibits the blinking reflex, salve is applied to lubricate the animal's eyes. The scientists use this opportunity to gather as much biological information as possible. The animal weighs 235 pounds, an average weight for a full-grown male. An examination of the teeth indicates he is about 16 years old. So that he can safely recover from the drug, the panda is placed back into the trap. A test of the radio receiver indicates that the transmitter on the collar is functioning well. The data that this panda will provide for conservation management will contribute to the preservation of the entire species. Every day, from sites throughout the study area, the scientists radio monitor the five collared pandas. The data gathered will eventually reveal each animal's daily routine, the size of its home range, and the extent of its seasonal movements. By tuning into different frequencies, the researcher knows which panda he is monitoring. The number of pulses per minute indicates whether the animal is active, traveling or eating, or inactive, resting or sleeping. Through simple triangulation, the panda's location is pinpointed. Time, temperature, and weather conditions will be correlated with the animal's behavior patterns.
Botanist Julian Campbell has joined the World Wildlife Team to work with Professor Chen Zhisheng, who has studied the flora here for several seasons. Their first task is to find a common language. Jin, Jin, branch. leaf. Hua, flower. Okay. But the great challenge that faces them is to determine abundance and growth of the bamboo. They will constantly check development in 10-foot square study plots. Learning the life history of the bamboo will help to answer the critical question, how much space does the panda need to survive? Not very many dead ones here yet, but they may start to die soon. <laughs> At the breeding station, Lily seems to be in her peak heat, and time is running out. But there must be consensus before an artificial insemination can be done. In some part, she's in stronger heat than last year. Uh, he agrees to do the artificial insemination today. He said, since we are doing scientific research, we must take some risk. He agrees to do artificial insemination today. He said we'd rather be a little earlier than to lose the chance. Because if we lose the chance, we can never find a chance again. Are we all agreed then? Yes, everybody. Okay, let's get to work. Liquid nitrogen is used to freeze a portion of the semen that has been collected from one of the mature male pandas. 1152. Placed in plastic straws, the frozen semen creates a kind of biological bank since it can be used even years later. Separation there? Look, and you see the separation. See, we're still not to the cervix. See the separation across the top? You see it? You see it? That's the thing I was talking about. Why yeah. there is Gondraki heard? Dolensek shares his expertise in the artificial insemination procedures with the young veterinarians. One of their hopes for the future of the panda is that someday. It will be routinely bred in captivity. For now, their wish is that this procedure is a success. That was a good insemination today. We shall have a baby panda. I hope so. We've got a good chance of it now. <laughs> good job. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. Good job. <laughs> good job. <laughs> I think today was a perfect day, and tomorrow on the following day, we should have a good chance, I think, with her. Despite artificial inseminations on the next two days, Lily does not become pregnant. There will be no baby panda born here this year. Through the frozen months of winter, the forest is silent and still. Most pandas stay at upper elevations, where one of the two types of bamboo in the study area is abundant. 
But as spring begins to stir, tender shoots of the other species push through the thawing earth on the lower slopes. Soon, the pandas will descend in search of the delicacy. In the plots laid out during winter, Dr. Campbell checks the new shoots. The researchers want to determine how much bamboo eaten consists of shoots, what consists of stems and leaves, and how the proportions change through the season. By May, the pandas are feasting on the new growth in the lower part of their range. Tracking and radio monitoring, the scientists intensify their efforts to observe the animals. For the first time in months, Schaller and Hu spot a lone collared panda feeding deep in a bamboo thicket. They stay quietly at a distance where their presence will not affect its natural behavior. It is a distinctly satisfying moment. Five days every month, the radio-colored pandas are monitored over a 24-hour period. Their activities are recorded every 15 minutes. Tonight, the monitoring will be done from the Schaller's tent. George, I'm going to go to sleep now. Wake me up if you get tired early. All right, you've got about five hours. Schaller has learned that pandas eat for as long as eight hours, then sleep one to four hours, eat again, then sleep again, around the clock, in order to get enough nutrition. Females have a small range, males a larger one. Throughout the year, males occasionally seek out females to determine where they can be found during the mating season. Gradually, the seasonal information begins to translate into pictures of the animal's behaviors. We appreciate very, very much the kindness and the friendship that has been shown to us here. At a farewell party for Kay Schaller, she proposes a toast to the pandas. So I would like to drink a special toast to the Shung Mao who has brought us together. She is returning home to care for the Shaller sons back from school for the summer. Shaller will continue his studies here. At the breeding station, the pandas spend the pleasant spring days in their natural habitat enclosures. Shaller comes to observe them, for he feels that he seldom sees enough of the reclusive wild animals. He speaks of their future. There's no question that the panda is a threatened species. The most immediate threat to panda certainly is habitat destruction, and that continues. So the general trend in panda numbers still slowly downhill. 
one of the goals of this project is to prepare the master plan so that the panda can be preserved and managed forevermore. In zoos throughout the world, a fight is also being waged to help ensure survival of the species. In China, there have been 31 zoo births. Here, at the Chengdu Zoo, six-month-old Jinjin is one of their latest successes. Perhaps he is a harbinger of some brighter future when no more pandas will be taken from the wild for zoos and captive red pandas might even be released into the wild. In March 1982, Ling Ling, the female of a pair of giant pandas given to the United States by the People's Republic of China 10 years earlier, is admitted to the hospital operating room at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. Repeated attempts to breed Ling Ling and the male Sing Sing have resulted in failure. Okay, we're in, guys. Now, distinguished medical professionals employ sophisticated tools to perform a unique operation. Because there are so few hours in a year when a panda can become pregnant, a laparoscope is used to see when ovulation is occurring. Yeah, we come back to use the mic, don't we? Okay, let's take it off and let's get this. There it is. Wait For the first time in history, a medical team is able to look inside the body of a female panda in heat. At what is judged to be the ideal time, semen is injected. Not, not externally, but you can see it pooling inside. Okay. Let's make sure the blade's there. If the procedure is successful, this will be the first time a giant panda is born in the United States. No, just take that one. We'll just take that one. By midsummer, Ling Ling is isolated to protect her from disturbance. The entire country anticipates the historic event. And at the zoo, a fascinated public gathers at a television monitor to watch her. Perhaps no one is more hopeful than Deborah Kleiman. She has spent a decade observing Ling Ling and knows that the panda probably has only five or six more years to breed. Now, back from China, Dr. Kleiman's first stop every morning is to review the videotapes made of Ling Ling's activities the night before. Hey, this is the sequence where they reported some rump rubbing, right? Yeah, I haven't, yeah. I haven't reviewed this tape, but this is the time frame. Dozens yeah. of volunteers watch, log, and tape Ling Ling 24 hours a day. It's been incredible. There's been more grooming than we've ever seen. And a lot of this. Yeah. A, lot of a baby panda weighs a mere four ounces to the mother's 250 pounds. Researchers must rely entirely on behavioral and physiological changes rather than appearance as indicators of a pregnancy. Now, has she been using old bamboo or... Uh... No, this is fresh. Well, she's really moving. She's not eating it. No, she's not she's eating. Around she's with not it. eating. And wait till she, she stands up a lot, as though she didn't know what to do with it. Yeah, I'd expect that, yeah. you know, because first births, yeah. I don't know, you often get animals showing a lot of random carrying of nest material yeah, until they get really close. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is really a good sign. Yeah. Okay, so what we have, we had last weekend, we had Thursday, Friday, Saturday, a lot of activity, a lot of rubbing. A lot of grooming. And since, what, Monday, yeah. Tuesday, nothing. Yeah. It's and gone a, down. a little bit of possible nest building, too. Yeah. Weekend. The staff continues to evaluate Ling Ling's behavior, and an optimistic nation watches and waits. On August 27th, 
After 1,300 hours of the pregnancy watch by volunteers, Zoo Director Dr. Theodore Reed right holds the press pregnancy, conference. Uh, she went through behavior patterns that led us to believe uh, that she was uh, pregnant. And we go from the heights of expectations to the sadness of not having uh, the baby. And I'm very, very disappointed and sorry that I have to announce that uh, there will be no uh, baby panda this year, and that next year we'll try again. Despite this crushing disappointment, there is reason to hope. In Mexico City, the first zoo-bred panda to survive outside China was born in July 1981. In most captive situations, male and female pandas have been kept apart, except when the female is in heat. Here, zoo authorities left the male and female together throughout the year with this wonderful result. This unique record, videotaped at the Mexico City Zoo, shows the panda in its first days of life, born pink-skinned with a silver sheen of sparse hair. It begins to acquire its distinctive markings in about a week. The tiny baby is fragile and completely helpless. With extreme delicacy and tenderness, the mother uses her mouth to move the baby, groom it, and take it up to nurse. Decades of hope and dedication seem to culminate in the miracle of this tiny life. But although the births of captive bred pandas are a major breakthrough in the preservation of this rare animal, we can never be assured of its survival unless it is safe in its wilderness home. George Schaller has written, we have all met species without a future and wish that we might be able to extend their existence. Such species evolved with us in a remote world and as each perishes, it takes with it an ancient knowledge which man may well need. The panda is more than an animal. It is a symbol of our commitment to the future. To lose this symbol because of neglect would be a disastrous moral blow to mankind. The effort to rescue this beleaguered species from the specter of extinction has begun. Only the conscience of a caring world, supporting scientific discoveries and wildlife management, can save the panda.